My name is Rich West, and I'm the chair of the Department of Communication Studies at Emerson College, and perhaps more importantly and relevant to you, I'm also the first vice president of the National Communication Association. As VP and the convention's primary program planner, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the 97th annual NCA convention. This session is being streamed live, and we pay a special welcome to our virtual audience as well. And for those of you who might be interested in this opportunity, there will be a video of this session that will be available on the NCA website when you return home. It's important to point out that this session would not be possible without the generosity of our friends, and they are our friends, at Rutledge, Taylor, and Francis Publishers. Kath Burton and her team have been a really great partner with us over the last couple of years for sponsoring opening sessions, and we really thank them for what I think is really un a very impressive, uh, impressive support. So please don't forget to drop by their exhibit area in the exhibit hall and really extend your authentic appreciation. New Orleans is really, to me, the perfect location to celebrate this year's convention theme, which by now, I hope, you know is one word, and yet a word that encapsulates a lot, the word voice. This city is known for so much, architecture, food, artistry, music, bourbon, food, and of course, the resiliency and creativity of what I think any of us would identify as remarkable citizens. Many months ago, as I was thinking about the unique features and the different qualities that this location afforded, I also knew we had to pay tribute to this remarkable city. That's why yesterday, on a beautiful sunny day, over 100 members of our organization rolled up their sleeves and went to work, doing their part to lend a hand and to put NCA's mission into practice. We shoveled sand, a lot of sand, we assembled walls, and we even painted an entire house all within three and a half hours. What I heard, yeah, truly. Most of us are still taking Advil this morning. What I heard from one of our NCA colleagues really underscores the entire morning. She said the following, this is also part of what we should be doing as an association, indeed. This session's title, Rebuilding Community After Crisis, is aimed at amplifying the voice of this city and the voice of this association. I also hope today that the voices of consciousness in this room will ignite as we listen to the words of our special guests. We begin our journey together with a welcome from the office of the mayor of New Orleans. Mary Beth Romig is the director of public relations and special projects for the office of Mayor Mitch Landrieu. Prior to that, she was the Director of Public Relations and Communications for the New Orleans Convention and Visitors Bureau, where she served as a spokesperson to the media in promoting New Orleans post-Katrina. Mary Beth, NCA is very happy to be here to help out your economy in both tangible and intangible ways and to be a part of this great community, so we welcome you. Thank you, everybody. Pardon my glasses. It's the age catching up to me. I'm sorry. Uh, first, behalf on, uh, on behalf of the mayor, Mitch Landrieu, and the city and citizens of New Orleans, thank you for choosing New Orleans for your conference. Having come from the background of the Convention and Visitors Bureau, I can sincerely tell you that meetings are the lifeblood of our tourism industry. And you all choosing New Orleans and saying yes to New Orleans really means a lot to us. There's no more fitting place to host a conference with this theme of rebuilding a community after crisis. Six years ago, our city came to a complete halt. Business, schools, lives, traditions, they all stopped. There were no more visitors, no more conferences, no more football, no commerce. Then the true challenge of getting the city open and literally living and breathing again commenced. The importance of voices cannot be overstated. In my former role at the CVB, it fell on us to inform the public of the state of the city, as we called it, as the city's administration had its own burdens and challenges. And our mission became clear. In a new world of 24-hour news coverage and archival footage that still shows New Orleans underwater today, and media rolling into our, citi into our city as our citizens were evacuating, we had to communicate the message that New Orleans would once again, and eventually became once again, open for business, as we fell on the new year in 2006. And over and over again, at first on a weekly basis, then monthly, 
until we reached the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, we had to continue to tell that story. And the challenge continues. And we face some really hard questions. And we could not spin. That was the bottom line. We had to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth was good, sometimes it was bad, and sometimes it can really get ugly. But we still had to be honest and passionate about our city and speak from the heart. Since those months, New Orleans has come a long way. And we are more than back. And under the leadership now of Mayor Mitch Landrieu, we are working to recreate the city that we all deserve, as he says. We certainly have rebuilt our community through crisis, or as the mayor says, through hell and high water, and we've had both. Some wonderful silver linings have come from the cloud of crisis that we have experienced in recent years. Really, I should say crises, because we've had Hurricane Katrina, then Rita, then Ike, then Gustav, then the National Recession, and then the BP oil spill. But a wonderful spirit of volunteerism emerged with generous people from church and school groups to associations and corporations coming to our aid with time, talent, and treasure. And they are still coming. Next year, as we open our arms to many national events, there will be more people coming from outside of New Orleans to help our city than we will be helping ourselves. It's a remarkable show of generosity. One of your presenters today, and a person I admire, Jim Pate, will speak to that spirit. What he and his organization have accomplished has been incredible. What is more important than giving a people, what is more important, I'm sorry, than giving a people a home again to call their own? And I want to thank you personally for what you did yesterday and what you continue to do with your book drive and with all the other acts of generosity that you're showing through your time in New Orleans over the next couple of days, including spending lots of money on food, on food, and music. And in the days and weeks following Katrina, when the news media informed those of us who had lost our homes and schools to put our kids in the schools wherever we found ourselves living or settled at the time, truly heartbreaking news, well, the most important question, what would happen to the ch children, loomed heavily. While I do not know Andrew well, I have seen him in action at his school, Arise Academy, and it is a sight to behold. What has happened in our local school system, the reforms that have taken place, is remarkable. Definitely, Arise Academy is a silver lining. And it is a pleasure to meet Mr. Fry today as well. So in the end, we truly have had to walk the walk and talk, to talk, talk the talk to show the world that New Orleans is one of the world's greatest cities, a city worth fighting for. We hope you feel that spirit yourself while you are here. We believe in our hearts that New Orleans' best days lie ahead. In the next 18 months, we will welcome some of the nation's and world's biggest events, Final Fours, the Super Bowl, the kickoff to a U.S. Navy commemoration of the War of 1812, not to forget our lineup of festivals and events and Mardi Gras that fill our calendar all year round. We truly are a championship city, and that is the message we want our voices to convey. Again, thank you for saying yes to New Orleans. We hope you have a wonderful conference. We are so glad that you chose New Orleans once again. And don't let this be your last time to come to New Orleans. Please come back, not just with the conference, but on your own to enjoy this incredible city and our incredible sense of hospitality. Thank you very much. Beth. In the spirit of rebuilding community after crisis, we are honored to have three people who will each speak for a few minutes about their views, their values, and for most of us, the most compelling, their life experience related to the voices of New Orleans and of the National Communication Association. I'm pleased to begin our session with an introduction of someone, and I really don't use this word a lot, but someone who actually my life experience suggests is a true pioneer, and that would be Jim Pate. Jim is the executive director of the New Orleans Area Habitat for Humanity, a position that he's held for about 11 years. For the past six years, Jim has been rebuilding New Orleans one house at a time. Before that, he directed the Dallas Area Habitat for Humanity. Under his leadership, the Dallas affiliate grew from constructing 10 houses a year to an annual production of 40 houses. Four years after Jim took over, the Dallas affiliate ranked sixth of the 1,500 affiliates nationwide. During this time, Jim also established the first prison partnership program using Habitat's mission as a form of rehabilitation and providing an opportunity for offenders to volunteer to make positive contributions. 
Jim became the executive director of the New Orleans Area Habitat in 2000. The New Orleans affiliate had constructed 101 homes prior to Hurricane Katrina, including 63 houses under Jim's leadership. Following Hurricane Katrina's devastation and the failure of the levees and flood walls, the affiliate has built more than 450 homes. Each one of these homes brings New Orleans one step closer to recovery. A new home means a new life and new opportunities. A new home means a new start. Throughout New Orleans, communities are helping one another rebuild themselves, and Jim is an integral part of this process. And let me close this introduction with this personal story. In January, while I was touring the Lower Ninth with Jim and others, I was struck by his optimism amidst what I was thinking was quite a bit of difficulty and quite a bit of despair. As we talked about the neighborhood where Brad Pitt, Bradford Marsalis, and Harry Connick Jr. have invested, Jim said something that continues to resonate with me. We were discussing all the homes that still need quite a bit of repair, and Jim said something that I found one of the most um, provocative and thoughtful statements. He stated, but there are pieces of hope in every neighborhood in this city. Pieces of hope. I wish to introduce a man with quiet integrity, a deliberative spirit, and yes, a man who represents a lot, a lot of hope around here, Mr. Jim Pate. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rich. Um, I speak to a lot of groups, and as some of you out on the job site heard yesterday, I'm what I call podium challenged. Um, but because we are streaming this, I'll try to stay here behind the mic, as hard as that might be. Um, but it's a particular delight to speak to all of you, because there are messages to come out of New Orleans and out of our experience that, as we now know, apply all over the country. The massive flooding, tornado damage, all of those things that have occurred in the last year or two. And you are the ones that can take that message most effectively, your communicators. Now, I will have to say I'm a little bit hesitant speaking to people like you with your knowledge and experience base. I'm always afraid I'll lose my train of thought or forget something. So let me get this out of the way first. It's Department of Energy. So, thanks. And the next thing I'd like to ask is everyone who went and worked on the job sites yesterday, if you're able, can you stand up real briefly so we can thank you? The great Oriental poet, philosopher, and spiritualist Rumi once used the words, the breath of the flute player, does it belong to the flute? You're here to bring a voice to this city, and I'm going to elaborate on that. I got back into New Orleans 11 days after the failure of the levees and flood walls. I live in the Bywater, which is part of the Ninth Ward, where we all worked. Uh, fortunately, my house did not flood, but the community did. Everywhere we looked, it was grim, gray. It's almost unbelievable if you did not see it. We're talking bushes and trees up to the waterline would be dirty brown, blank gray. Might be a little bit of green at the top of the tree. Houses, fences, automobiles, all bore water lines or were brown and gray. Other than the occasional uh, National Guard patrols coming by at about 5 o'clock in the morning, or the Humvees or the big vehicles, there really weren't any sounds. I'd been back in New Orleans probably two weeks and the local National Guard people, we weren't really supposed to be back, so it's kind of illegal. But I would set up a Coleman stove in front of my house and make coffee. So the National Guard folks called me the coffee man. And they would go through because they would rotate. Oregon, Washington, uh, New York, National Guard people would swap off every month or so. 
and they would come by and they'd check their little pad. And of course they had my regular name and identification, but they'd look at it and go, oh yeah, you're the coffee guy, you're okay. So I'd get, I got to stay. Now it helped that a bunch of them were bivouacking in a warehouse that Habitat used a few blocks away, so I made a deal, you let me stay here, you can stay in my warehouse. Um, there was a lot of bartering going on in New Orleans in those days. But anyway, about two weeks after I got back, I'm sitting on the front porch, front steps, the stoop as we call it around here, and the sun's coming up and I've got my cup of coffee and I heard a strange sound, one I hadn't heard in a while. It was the voice of a bird, a bird call. I jumped up, coffee went flying everywhere, and I was kind of like Bill Cosby. Look, it's a bird! It's a bird! And I was just so excited about that bird. Fairly shortly after that, Harry Connick Jr. and Branford Marsalis contacted us about an idea they had. And that idea was that they were so concerned and disturbed that we had so many New Orleans musicians, many of whom live under, I guess we'll call it fragile economic circumstances. As the saying goes, what do you call a drummer who's lost his girlfriend? The answer, of course, is homeless. Um, <laughs> so the concern was that we would lose the rich musical heritage of New Orleans, the very voice of the city, that they could not come back. They could not afford to come back, or in those early days, there wasn't a place for them to come back. We lost 185,000 dwelling units across the city. What little was beginning to become available. Basically, it was the landlord's price, whatever he wanted to pay. We also had what we call the FEMA tax, which means that the government workers who came down were pretty much willing to pay whatever was out there at the taxpayer's expense. So regular folks couldn't always afford the rents that arose out of that. So their idea was, let's start a little place, a Habitat House place. Harry had been working with us for a long time, where we can bring musicians back. They can buy a house, a decent, safe, and affordable house, very modest, and afford to live here. And they will have a home, and their roots will continue to stay deep in the fabric of our great community. Shortly after that, I got a call from senior pastor at First Baptist Church, David Crosby. Now, David and I had been talking about a large project they wanted to take on, 20 houses. I figured he was calling because his church was completely flooded. And I figured David was calling to say, Jim, you know those 20 houses we were planning to start? Well, we can't do it. Instead, he says, Jim, you know those 20 houses we were going to do? Can we make it 40? Can we make it 40 houses? And being, as Rich was pointing out, somewhat hopeful, I said, sure, David, we can do that. When do you want to start? We didn't even own any land at that point. But we soon remedied that problem, started building our houses. And as we started building, we found ourselves overwhelmed with people, volunteers, who wanted to come back and help. And we're now at a different stage. This is not the emergency stage where you're trying to evacuate people or get food and water to the survivors and the construction crews and all. This was a time of recovery, but we were still a devastated city. So we started what we called Camp Hope. And that's three hots in a cot. Uh, the first couple of years, they didn't pay anything. They just came in. We gave them cots, dorm-style living, uh, almost embarrassing uh, shower and bathroom facilities. Uh, we managed to feed them, uh, give them a little sack lunch to take out to the job site. And we started with our first facility with 250 beds. Within six months, we were hosting 400 to 500 volunteers a night. A year, late, year and a half later, after the failure of the levees and flood walls, 
We opened Camp Hope too, and we housed 800 to 1,000 volunteers a night for a significant period of time. At one point, the Sheridan, the Marriott, were number one and two in terms of hospitality industry, and Camp Hope was number three. Uh, now I will add, when the hospitality industry got back up on their feet, we closed down Camp Hope so that our volunteers could continue to contribute to the economic recovery of the city. We've recruited and deployed over 150,000 volunteers. That's just our, our organization. Uh, as Mary Beth alluded to, and as I can confirm, there were dozens, hundreds, thousands of other volunteers working for other worthy nonprofits, working for Methodist Disaster Relief, Lutheran Disaster Release, Relief. They were working through individual faith communities, or maybe they just knew somebody. I'm working with someone in Atlanta and her mama lost her house. Let's go back and gut it out and take care of it. In the first five months following the deluge, as we call it, New Orleans Habitat couldn't build any houses. There was no infrastructure, no government officials to issue uh, permits or anything. And so we gutted 2,400 houses, more than any other organization. But remember, there were 185,000 to gut. So that continued to pace as we went on. But the most important thing, again, as Mary Beth talked about, was that those of us who lived here and were trying to work through a recovery and through a rebuilding process, and now to what our fabulous mayor, Mitch Landrieu, calls the democracy, the laboratory of democracy, we're now building a new and better New Orleans, a fairer and juster community, we hope. And it's going to pace, but that would not have happened without the volunteers, the thousands of volunteers who came out. All of you who worked yesterday, because there's still much to do, the volunteers who came gave us, who were here day in, day out, in a sad and tragic circumstance. No food, no grocery stores. Well, there were a couple of bars. <laughs> Johnny White's has never closed in the history of New Orleans, just so you'll know. But in those dark days, everything was tough. It was tough to get up every day, to face the devastation, to try to rebuild it, to try to become the support from someone else. And then volunteers would come in. And they would give us an emotional and a spiritual uplift for which there are inadequate words of gratitude. I cannot tell you how much that meant. So the volunteers and people like you, whether you worked on a job site or helped our economy, or, or just go back and share messages back home. You are the voice of the flute player. Your breath has given life to our wonderful, precious, and fragile city, and to its citizens, and to its communities. And we are so very grateful for that, and I thank you all. Our second ambassador of all that's good in New Orleans is Andrew Shahan. Andrew is the founder and principal of Arise Academy, a transformational charter school in the Upper Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Andrew began his career teaching children with severe behavioral disabilities and went on to design and oversee the special education program for the Kip Star Charter School in Harlem. Working with Kip, Andrew witnessed firsthand the power of high expectations and standards of excellence. During the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Andrew wrote the charter for Arise Academy, an elementary school that would rekindle quality education in New Orleans. The following year, the school opened its doors to 220 children. 
Arise Academy offers full-time music and art programs and prepares every child for success in high school, college, and beyond. And the goal of the Academy is to help every child reach the level of mastery rather than just proficiency. Children who attend Arise are not merely students, they are, and I heard him call them then, scholars, realizing opportunities that would otherwise be unimaginable. Finally, let me share another story. When I visited Andrew's school, I have to tell you that I had really goosebumps the entire time. Two things stood out from this January visit. First, the children. So the words adorable, well-mannered, curious, thoughtful, they quickly come to mind. But secondly, there's Andrew himself. He couldn't stop talking about his kids his school. I knew immediately that I wasn't just talking to a school principal. I was talking to a man with principles that very few of us will ever experience. I'm pleased to introduce a second New Orleans hero, Mr. Andrew Shahan. That, that was a pretty amazing uh, I don't know if the rest of my story goes uphill from there. If you guys just bear with me for a second, because I actually had planned uh, to put something on the PowerPoint here um, for you guys, but I got a little bit disrupted. So both these two cables don't fit at the same time. Should I take the sound out? No. While my friend's working on this, actually, I'm going to jump ahead here. Um, as any of you, have you, raise your hand if you, there's any teachers in the crowd or ever been a teacher. All right, all right. Hey, there we go. So as any good teacher goes, I'm going to improvise just a little bit while my lesson gets on track, okay? And at, in my reflection today, I will say come 30 minutes earlier, okay, even though I did come a little bit early. So right now what I want you to do is you guys have been sitting around for a few minutes. I'm going to share a couple things, and they're in my PowerPoint. First and foremost, Arise Academy is built on values, okay? That's what the name stands for. It couldn't be more congruent. So our values are achievement respect, innovation, service, and enthusiasm. And it just so happens to spell Arise Academy, and I think it's a really beautiful name, okay? So Arise Academy, and all of that stands for values. That's not even the good part yet. Okay, so at our school, we do more than just have strict academics, even though our academic program is very rigorous, and we're very serious about that. Um, but we also, we, we teach about values because there's also the other side. It doesn't do you any good with all the intelligence in the world if you don't have some kind of principles backing it up. So we do a lot of talking in our school about not, it's not pulling up. Okay. We do a lot of talk. That's fine. He does a lot of talk. We do a lot of talk at our school about achievement, respect, innovation, service, and enthusiasm. So if you're talking out in the middle of class, you're not admonished for talking out. You're encouraged to monitor your respect, okay, and what that is. And we all held those values very seriously. Students, parents, uh, myself, all teachers. So we also play a little game at our school, and I'm going to have to, all right, here we go. So I'm going to teach you guys, yeah, good job, good job, my friend. So we're going to play, uh, we're going to try to play this little game here. Oh, wow, that's super slow, huh? So we're going to pass through that, all right? So this is the mission of our school, and everybody needs to know this because a lot of people have mission statements, but they're dry, they're dormant. People don't use them. We use this mission statement every day. Passionately raising each child's academic, social, and physical levels to be successful in high school, college, and the world beyond. Okay, boom, I don't know who that guy is, all right? So... Let me show you real quick, and I hope you're paying attention because you're going to need this in a second. Trust me, you're going to need this. So we show achievement, and we have a sign for it. In our school, achievement is reading a book. There you go. You're smart. You're practicing already. You, you've got it down. Okay. He's going to need it, and he's probably going to be the winner. You're my favorite, all right? Here we go. So achievement is our first value, and we show that. There we go. Okay, respect. We also have respect. Now, this doesn't necessarily get you to college. Being able to do this probably is not going to get you to college. Walking down the hallway like this is probably not going to get you to college. But we do expect this out of our scholars to be sitting with their hands on top of the desk, eyes tracking the speaker, body facing, because that way we can take in the most information possible. So as we're sitting up and we say respect at our school, you'll see a lot of scholars do this, even if they're standing up. Okay. How's this? How's this now? Oh, perfect. Oh, my goodness. 
This just changed my life. Okay. <laughs> Much as my uh, journey to New Orleans has. But uh, So this has definitely changed my life. So here we go. Achievement. Respect. All right. Now you guys are just like on the edge of your seats. What's innovation? What's innovation? What's innovation? And you guys didn't get to hear my Black Eyed Peas presentation at the beginning. So anyway. Innovation. And at our school, to be honest with you, and I won't go into this now. If people want to have drinks later, I'll go into it. We're not really doing anything innovative, and I'll get into that later. We actually just execute, okay? But at Arise Academy, innovation means we seek... Why am I still doing that? At Arise Academy, innovation means that we seek solutions to problems, okay? We find answers. So at our school, anytime anybody says innovation, everybody goes... Okay, so it's like... Let me just, respect. Ooh. Innovation. Ooh, I got some of you are going down in a minute. You're going down. Okay, so at our school, we seek solutions to problems, all right? Here we go. Now, what service you add, which is personally, I mean, I like all the values, but I got to say service is probably the one I love the most because I think it just makes you feel great, okay? So service, go ahead, right? That's, kinda, that's what we use. We serve other people because we know that when we serve other people, we win and we feel really good and we like to feel good. So service is powerful at our school and we do a lot of talking about it. When you get up, there's no, students at our school don't push to get in line because, right, we show service to others. All right, and the last one finally is innovation. And when everybody, anybody says innovation at Arise Academy, everybody shows teeth. And I'm sorry, that's right. See, I tried to trick you again. How'd you know I wasn't tricking you? So at, at Arise Academy, anytime someone says enthusiasm, everybody shows their teeth. I don't even really smile like this. I actually close it. But I do this at Arise Academy because we show enthusiasm and we're positive about learning and we're positive about life in general. So if I see a scholar and he's struggling or he's down, I say, show me your enthusiasm. And you can't ever not get a smile out of that, all right? So I hope you were watching. My friend I already told you you're my favorite. If you win, you get an extra prize, okay? But right now, there's an opportunity for you to show what you know, okay? And before I do start this, I'm going to have to lay some ground rules. Okay, I'm going to depend on honesty out of you. I'm going to depend that you respect others when we do this. Yeah, everybody's like, yeah. I'm going to depend that you respect other people. But first and foremost, if this finger points at you and does this, you sit down. Okay, so there we that's respect too, right? So you guys are like, what? Okay, I'd like everybody to stand up. You've been sitting too long. We've got to get up and we've got to move just a little bit. Yeah, here we go. Watch them. Actually, you guys want to help me? Do the, let's do this. Mingle out through there. And when I give you the signal, they'll, they'll, you'll understand what we're doing. Ask them to sit down, okay? If they're not right, ask them to sit down. Okay, so let's go through it. Let's warm up. Here we go. Here we go. Achievement. Clear it out. Clear it out. Shake it out. Come on. Respect. Okay, clear it out. Relax. We're going through these. There's no pressure right now. Innovation. Okay, clear it out. Good. It looks like you've got it. Some people must have really hammered hard yesterday. And by the way, this doesn't cut it. Okay? <laughs> it sticks straight. Bam. Okay? Which arm? Uh, we go with right arm generally, but you know, lefties are okay too. I guess. All right. So then we go with, we're all cleared again, service. Okay? Clear it out. And the last one is no movement with the body, it's only the face. And if we get really down to it, it's only going to be the mouth. But here we go. So there we go. You got it. Okay, clear them all out. Now this time, you, might, you all did really well that time, so you're going to remain standing and stuff. But this time, I'm going to go a little bit faster. And I'm also going to throw in some variables, all right? So if you happen to get the signal wrong, I'm going to want you to go ahead and be honest and take a seat. But don't worry, because I've got some great people helping me here. If they ask you, you take a seat too. And remember what I said at the beginning. If this finger comes at you and you'll know it, you take a seat, all right? And I really can't hold anything over your head, but you won't be allowed to play next time if you don't follow the rules. Okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Achievement. All of you did that, sit down. If you don't have the book, take a seat, okay? Oh my goodness, my kids, I should have brought some of them. They would have smoked you, that was disgraceful. Okay, I'm going to need you to pay a little bit more attention. I encouraged you at the beginning, okay? Here we go. So clear them out. Respect. Service. You didn't do it. Take a seat. You got to hit it the first time. You can't wait and then look at me, okay? Um, clear them out. 
Enthusiasm. All your hands sit down. Yeah, this is usually like around, around the 10th round that I start doing this, but you guys are way too big, okay? Um, so here we go, super challenge around. Keep your eyes, because some of these people, look, they, look, they, they look quite sneaky. Okay. Respect. Okay, there's more of you cleared out. All right, now, now here's what we go, judges, up the ante. If it's not the first motion or if they're late, go ahead and tell them to sit down, all right? Service. Thank you. Thank you. Enthusiasm. I can't see you back there. I hope those are teeth, man. I hope those are teeth. All right? I can't see. I don't know if she's really smiling. Somebody's like, I'll just stand still. I'll make it. Okay. Here we go. Enthusiasm. Got you again. I just did that. Come on. Here we go. All right. Service. Couple slow ones over here. Couple slow ones. Okay. Clear them out. Innovation. Take a seat, buddy. Okay. I got to monitor this one over here because there's a large group. That's too sneaky. Okay. All right. Are we ready? Clear them out. Clear them out. Service. Okay, you were slower though in that group. Take a seat. Here we go. Um, enthusiasm. Okay. Now what I would do normally, I'm going to try to monitor you all. One person will be removed each round, okay? Here we go. Achievement. Yeah. yeah. There's no hard feelings here. We're going to play again. Not today. Okay. Respect. Hey, you did good though. Don't let anybody tell you you didn't do good. So here we go. One, two, three, right? Innovation. You were the last one. Sorry, sweet. Sit down. All right. Yep, and then there were two. So I just wanted, I'm sorry, I have to stop right now. After this next move, somebody will be going home with this. Okay? I don't mean to put any pressure on you or to make this any harder than it is, but somebody's going home with this. And here we go. You don't know which one. You know it's going to be one of five, but you don't know which one. Clear it out. Clear it out. Innovation. She's the winner. Come on over here. Come on over here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Ayah. Okay, gotcha. So just as it was told, hurry up. So then I'm kidding. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, so those are our values, and I have to do that, and I did put a big emphasis on that because that's the core of our school, okay? We do a lot of things that other people do, and a lot of best practices. We're actually not an experiment. We have the best practices there are, but the tie that binds at our school are our values. When our kids come to the door, I say, who are you? They say, I'm a scholar, but actually most of them say, I'm an Arise Academy scholar. Being a part of our school means so much to the kids that go to our school, and I, I'm gonna get into why that is. So here we go, the history of a transformation. I did come to New Orleans in 2007, um, and I, I'm not from that far north, but I guess uh, I have been called a carpetbagger. But I did come here specifically to start a charter school. Um, I had worked in Harlem and started a middle school there, um, and it was, a, it was a great experience. But I, got, I wanted to do something different because a lot of my students went to uh, high school and college, and they didn't actually do so well. Um, they, did, they did better than if they had gone to their district school, but they, didn't, they didn't weren't doing so well. And I was like, why? Well, when you're so far behind academically and you have to go to school for like we did in New York from 7 till 7 and we didn't have any elective classes, it was all academics. And while your academic proficiency raised, there were other parts of your life that really suffered. Um, I, I know for like large periods of my life, I never saw the sun outside unless, you know, during the day because we were inside working. So I started thinking, why are my kids being successful in college? Well, you know what? Because their middle, their middle school experience doesn't look anything like kids who are going to middle school. So when they went to high school, these great high schools we got them in, they didn't have anything in common, right? So I went back and said, let me investigate what kids are doing that is being successful in college and in great high schools, great high schools, great colleges. And that is, so I look at their middle school experience. And what can you guess? It was very well-rounded. 
arts programs. We have visual art. We have resident artists at Arise Academy who go into the classroom and create engaging lessons. We have music. We're in New Orleans. We have vocal and instrumental music programs. Um, we have a multimedia program. We have a theater program. Uh, we have 200 scholars that play tennis at our school. With the, last year, the coach at Xavier University was their tennis coach, okay? They're doing a lot of things and making a lot of connections to the world through our program. Um, so I'm not going to show that clip because I don't have a lot of time. Summer 2008, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say, actually, that's when I met Jim and I met Julie, who you guys worked with at Projects with Purpose. Summer of 2008, um, that, that's basically when I wrote the charter for Arise Academy and started meeting people out in New Orleans. December, 2000, December 4th, 2008, that was when our charter was approved by Bessie. So I wrote this 300-page plan, part business plan, part academic plan, presented it to the state board, and the board said, that's a great plan. We're going to approve your charter. So I had this ability to run a school in New Orleans. Uh, then they said, four RSD transformation charters among new RSD charters winning Bessie approval. Great. March 1st, someone came, came to me and said, hey, I heard you've got this charter. Do you want to participate in this transformation process? Tell me more. So they, they said, hey, listen, uh, we've got this school that's down in the Ninth Ward, and it's called Dr. Charles Drew. And so they really dressed this up and, and tried to make it look sexy for me. And they were like, yeah, it's the worst school in New Orleans. And I was like, cool. Okay. And this, so then I was like, well, wait a second. New Orleans, it's the worst school in New Orleans. New Orleans has the worst schools in the state. Um, the state has the worst schools in the nation. Oh, you want me to, to open a school in the worst school in the United States of America? And, mm -hmm, okay. And so I and so thought about it for a little bit, and then I was like, you know what? It really doesn't change the mission of the school. It doesn't change the program. Is it going to be a little bit harder to change a culture that's pretty poor? Absolutely. But uh, it really didn't change what we were going to do. So I said, hey, this doesn't. This couldn't be any harder. Just get on. Let's go. You know. So we went over to Dr. Charles Drew. Um, started looking around, and indeed it was, I'm not even going to mince words here, it was an awful, completely awful place. Um, it was not only awful in terms of the facility that was there, but it was academically horrible. It was just not safe. Had I not have been six foot tall, 180 pounds, you know, and can and have, you know, somewhat of a, a, a guy and like to be tough, that would have been an ugly place, okay? Needless to say, I wouldn't let my children go anywhere near that place. And the fact is, everyone there who had a child there, that was, they were only there because they could not do anything else. And that's just not fair. So it was extremely chaotic. So I started spending some time there. Um, and here we come to Charles Drew. July 19, 2009 was when we first invited teachers in. Um, I have an entire video that's processed in between here about how Jim and Julie and a lot of other people in the city got together with us. We physically carried everything out of this building, emptied it. Um, Keith, if you're back there, Keith spent the whole summer at Arise Academy. We took everything out of it, scrubbed it down, painted it, and put everything back in the building. And it looks, if you come in the bottom of our floor, second floor is still getting there, but if you come to the bottom in our school, I challenge you to find me a private school in the city once you get inside of those classrooms. That's any better. We have smart boards. It's phenomenal. Okay, what the students are doing. We're running. I'm going fast. Um, so, raising the bar. Let me just share a couple things with you. If you'll look up here, 2000 and, uh, let's look at the year. This is 2010. Um, look at that reading score, 26%. Math, 30%. These are our kindergartners, okay? This is, and by the way, when we tested them at the beginning of the year, they were at the third percentile. That means in the United States, out of 100 kids, they were the three lowest. That's what our kids ranked in. And there's a plus or minus of three points. <laughs> Fast forward one year. Now look at those numbers, 26 and 30. 52%, 73%. That's on a nationwide scale. Okay, Anything over 50% is considered college prep. These are our first graders who are already really behind. The first year, at the end of the year, they got up to the 16th percentile from the third grade. Math, 16. Next year, 28% in reading, 47% in math. Okay, So they're going, now these are scholars who got a terrible education. Okay, Basically, they tested in not knowing their alphabet. Next year, let's look at second grade, even more behind students. Okay, 15% up to, and 16%. We're up to 21 and 31%. What I, this is our third grade LEAP scores. Okay, so the first time we took sta uh, standardized tests, 
There were 25% of the students had Charles Drew. 25% scored basic. The next year when our kids took it, 50% of them fell over into the basic. That's 100% improvement. All right. This year and the goal of the school is to have 100% proficient. And we feel like we're definitely going to make, make those gains. Um, I guess in parting, and I'm going to sum it up, I had you know, much longer things to say, but I guess in parting what I'd like to say to you is thank you for keeping us in mind. And I'm, I think I have the greatest job in the world. I love working with my kids who I think are the toughest, smartest, best behaved kids in the United States. Um, and I'm just so appreciative of people who keep us in mind and know and really check on Arise Academy because we're not just going to become a decent school. We're going to become the best school in this city, even better than selective admission schools. So just keep us in mind. Keep checking us out. And I want to just thank you so much for everything that you've done. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry. I ran out of time. All right. What? to communication and social justice is, in a word, relentless. He's the Ronald K. Calgard Professor of Communication and Social Justice at Trinity University in Texas and also a professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Fry is the recipient of numerous awards for scholarship, including NCA's own Gerald Phillips Award for Distinguished Applied Communication. He's the author or editor of 16 books and more than 80 publications. He's also the former president of the Central States Communication Association, and those of us who read the journals know that he sits on several editorial boards. What distinguishes Dr. Fry's scholarship is his resolve to use communication as a form of activism to promote social justice and amplify the voices of those who are disenfranchised or otherwise unheard. In his own words, his research, quote, seeks to understand how participation in collective communicative practices makes a difference in people's lives. For instance, Dr. Fry's work with a dance and theater company to make collaborative art accessible to people of all culture and economic backgrounds. He's also advocated for a residential facility for AIDS patients. This is the sort of stuff that makes our field so much more important. Larry Fry brings his resolve for social justice into the classroom and to our association. He's able to weave elegantly communication theory, methods, and pedagogies to help us understand and empower those who are powerless and promote the values we wish to see in our communities and in our world. Finally, Larry Fry is a special colleague in that he's doing what we all should try to do, making a difference with our research. We thank the late Dr. Dwight Conkergood for really getting our field moving in this direction many years ago. Today, we extend even more gratitude to Dr. Larry Fry for sustaining the vision of doing something with our research that helps others and our culture overall. Providing us a scholarly context to our opening session is a prolific and, yes, just an overall great scholar, thinker, and person, Dr. Larry Fry. Well, I want to thank Jim and Andrew for their uh, moving and energetic um, talks. And more importantly, for the significant difference that these advocates of and for humanity have made in the struggle to rebuild the New Orleans community after the devastating crises that it's experienced. They clearly have been at ground zero of building community after crisis. I also want to thank Rich for planning this convention and for putting together this particular panel and for inviting me to talk about the importance of bridging theoretical and applied concerns to produce engaged communication scholarship that can contribute to rebuilding communities after crisis and more generally social justice with those who are marginalized, oppressed, and under-resourced. I'm tremendously honored. I start from the assumption, whether it's correct or not, that all scholars, all of us who are sitting in this room, but especially those in the practical discipline of communication, to use Bob Craig's perspective, want to make the type of difference through their research and teaching and service in local, regional, national, and global communities and the crises facing them that Jim and Andrew have made and continue to make on an everyday basis. 
Scholars, and I use that term for both teachers and researchers, desire to make a difference has been fueled by the relatively recent acceptance of, and some might even argue, seismic shift in the academy in general and in the communication discipline in particular to community-based research that is conducted in partnership with public and private stakeholders to address critical social issues and to contribute to the public good, or what has been called engaged scholarship. I don't have the time to go into detail, but suffice it to say that engaged scholarship represents at least in part a return to the roots of the academy in the United States. After all, many U.S. colleges and universities, such as the colonial colleges and the land-grant institutions, were established at least in part with generating knowledge about their communities for the purpose of bettering them. During much of the 20th century, however, as we well know, universities turned away from their civic mission to become instead powerful research engines that produced research directed toward a relatively small insular group of fellow scholars, supported, by the way, by in many cases by public monies, but also private monies, rather than producing research for and with their communities and the broader society and the world. Moreover, such disciplinary research privilege theory over application. The communication discipline, despite emerging at least as a formal discipline with the goal of seeking solutions to practical issues related to communication, such as teaching people how to be better speakers in their everyday interactions and in the public sphere, and to engage in effective communicative practices for democratic group decision making, certainly experienced its growing pains during the 1970s and 1980s, and even into the 1990s with regard to the theory application battle. Why, who can forget, for instance, the 1982 statement that Donald Ellis from the University of Hartford made, which was really directed toward professional communication education programs and related outreach efforts, um, but was, such as consulting, but was widely interpreted, including by Ellis himself, as an indictment of applied communication scholarship. He said that such scholarship was, quote, theoretically vacuous, without a research base, and just as a side, morally degenerate and politically naive, and that these professional aims of speech communication do a disservice to the true goal of scholarly inquiry. By 1991, however, after a decade of that type of research, Don certainly had changed his view stating at that time that, quote, applied research is critical to the professional and intellectual development of communication. Today, Don does amazing theoretically infused applied communication scholarship with Ifat Mayos, the recently deceased Dan Baran, and others, facilitating transformational dialogue between Israeli Jews and Palestinians in his Middle East Mirror Peace and Conflict Politics translational scholarship blog is a must read. That battle between theory and application now seems so 1980s in the communication discipline. Indeed, I'd say that given the increased use of participatory, community-based research methods, the growing service learning movement, the number of civic education courses that are now offered, and the many alternative pedagogies that have been advanced, among many other developments, engaged scholarship now is so taken for granted that it probably is in danger of being labeled as so 2010. Sort of. I don't want to put a damper on this love fest of patting ourselves on the back for all of our engaged sco scholarship. Well, maybe I do, but let's take a closer look at it. For as Michael and Ruth Bowman of LSU asked in their journal article, telling Katrina stories, problems and opportunities and engaging disaster, the question was never, should one be engaged? Rather, the question always was over the manner and means of engagement. What form should engagement take? To answer that question in the context of this opening session on rebuilding community after crisis, and more specifically, rebuilding New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, I conducted a search of the communication uh, literature. There are about 100 journal articles listed in the communication and mass media complete database alone with the word Katrina or another relevant term in the title of the article. Those articles span much of the discipline from group and organizational and health to rhetoric to critical cultural media studies. We now have empirical evidence 
and I am reading directly from the research reports, of what Kenneth Burke proclaimed long ago, that the, quote, description of a terrific storm is symbolically charged, that the visual paradox of purification, such that purifying discourses must be of the same symbolic substance as the polluted images that goad them, complicated ritual attempts to both purge and commemorate Katrina evacuees. How talk around disasters reinforces intersectional hierarchies of difference that legitimate gender-based violence. That although the care communication following Katrina was adequate, inadequate clarity, insufficient credibility, and a failure to properly adapt to critical audience resulted in a failure of consensus and crisis communication. How various documentaries about Katrina exposed the materiality of traumatic space and how the New Orleans Common Ground Collective were consistently demonstrated subaltern agency in its efforts of solidarity, resistance, and reconstruction. Now, I have great respect for that work, but I would hate to ask our esteemed chair and our colleagues here on the panel, the speakers, how that scholarship was or might be helpful in their efforts and others on the ground to rebuild the New Orleans community after Katrina. Eric Rothenbuehler of Ohio University eloquently wrote that communication and community grow in each other's shadows. The possibilities of one are structured by the possibilities of the other, but it's hard to see the applied truth of that statement from a review of that literature. One reason for the lack of contribution that this, quote, engaged scholarship makes or has made, and some might even contest calling it that, is because it generally adopts our disciplines, previous physics envy, that privileges theory over application, or more accurately, the type of research that is privileged from the perspective of theory. Because if you trace the etymology of the word theory, it is derived from the Greek word theoria, which means contemplation, speculation, looking at things, meaning that scholars are supposed to be spectators whose work is best done by looking at and contemplating what occurs without trying to affect it. That type of spectator scholarship is what Kevin Kerrigy of Suffolk University and I refer to as third-person perspective research, in which researchers, communication researchers, study the stream or golf, in the case of New Orleans, of human events by standing outside of it, observing, describing, analyzing, interpreting, explaining, sometimes critiquing, and sometimes offering recommendations for someone else to do such as building a levy. That scholarship stands in stark contrast to what Kerrigan and I call first-person perspective research, where communication scholars intervene into discourses using their communication resources, their theories, their methods, their pedagogies, and other practices to make a positive difference in the material and symbolic world. From that perspective, what is missing in our literature, or the literature I just mentioned, is any sense of how communication research or teaching aided the rebuilding of community in New Orleans or changed anything related to the problems experienced in the aftermath of Katrina, or how it will help to prevent another crisis here or elsewhere from occurring. Indeed, there's no evidence that that research has or will affect anything in any way at any time. I could find only two interventions in that literature. One was a study of lessons learned about emergency communication challenges in response to Katrina that was conducted by Marsha Vandeford when, at the CDC. The other was by Daniel Vins, I hope I'm pronoun pronouncing her name accurately, was about her solo performance script, Hang It Out to Dry, that depicted the struggles, hopes, and fears that many St. Bernard Parish community members have faced years after the storm. I'm sure there's additional intervention communication scholarship that may be forthcoming. There are people working on it. Former NCA President Dan O'Hare has an NSF grant in which he is studying um, how people prefer to receive hurricane warnings and that will all lead to an app on one's phone that will pr provide that preferred warning. And there is intervention work being done by communication educators. As just one example, Shawnee Anderson, Associate Dean of All Good Things, I guess she's called it, St. Mary's College of California has created a deep immersion program at her college. In 2006, 2007, 2008, they brought to New Orleans all of the food, water, and materials, um, even showers and uh, porta pots that they needed to live 
in a sleeper bus, and they completed more than 15,000 hours of direct hurricane relief, collaboratively working with residents of the upper and lower ninth wards. Along the way, they documented their experiences and the stories of the families with whom they worked, generating about 1,000 hits a day on their relief blog and awakening many unaware readers of the continuing trauma the New Orleans residents faced long after the storms. And of course, those who participated in the service day yesterday um, experienced the kind of fulfillment that comes from that. Shawnee hasn't written that uh, work up yet, although she owes me a chapter if you're out there, Shawnee. But other uh, communication scholars have published what Carrigie and I refer to as communication activism for social justice uh, scholarship in which communication scholars work with and for those who are marginalized, oppressed, and under-resourced to promote social justice. They understand the difference between charity and social justice. It's sort of like that old story where the father of the college student, the senior who's graduating, says to the teacher, you know, I'm so glad that my daughter got a chance to work in that soup kitchen. I hope that when my daughter, who's in high school now, goes to college, she too will have a chance to work in the soup kitchen, right? Not understanding, of course, that the whole goal would be to get rid of those soup kitchens, right? And so we featured that kind of scholarship that focused on social justice in a two-volume set and now a third volume that's coming out um, this week and should be here at the convention. Hint, hint. Go take a look at it. Um, and I just want to give you some very quick examples of that scholarship. Um, Espoma Jovanovic and her colleagues at the University of North Carolina have engaged in a wide variety of communication activities. They're hosting dialogues with the Greensboro Truth and Community Reconciliation Project that uh, deals with a race relations tragedy that happened in that city back in 1979 and from which it never um, recovered. The Public Dialogue Consortium, uh, founded by that great human being who we lost, Barnett Pierce, about a week and a, a half ago, have facilitated public dialogues, numerous Com communities and countries to increase cultural richness. Chris Carey, who is director of the Daywalker Foundation, worked to prevent human trafficking by sponsoring conferences in India for local stakeholders to overcome the lack of communication among those working in the field. Wendy and Michael Papa, along with Rick Burkell, who offered interpersonal communication skills training as part of a small business that they created to provide livable wages to people living in poverty in the Appalachian region of Southeast Ohio. David Palmer, who used an emergent consensus program with an activist anti-globalization group as it planned for and took part in an international trade summit protest held in Miami at the same time that we were meeting in panels there at NCA. Stephen Harton at the University of Colorado Denver employed his rhetorical training from facilitating teachings to engaging in startling and chance interpersonal mediated communication to protest the war in Iraq and reclaim democracy from empire. Linda Welker and her class have staged a prayer for Sudan, performance of Sudanese refugee narratives to make people aware of and do something about the genocide in South Sudan. Lynn Harder and her colleagues, uh, many of them in India, have facilitated participatory theater performance in India by young men and women performing for the very first time to protest the practice of dowry. Jeanette Drake using her public relations skills to try to shut down confined animal feeding operations in Ohio. Mar Edelman who made a video documentary that was shown on PBS to promote awareness of and funding for a residential facility for people with AIDS and she and I have engaged in a lot of volunteer skills training and offered many other programs at that resident. And of course Dwight Conkergood who made that award winning video documentary about, about gangs. Sunwolf who offers workshops that teach defense attorneys attorneys to engage in death talk to dismiss potential jurors who support the death penalty and then Jennifer Asinas and her colleagues who actually conducted a communication campaign that resulted in Kenneth Foster Jr's death sentence being commuted to life in prison and in Texas no less where Governor Rick Perry is applauded for putting people to death and John McHale made a video documentary that actually saved an innocent man on death row in Missouri these and other scholars who conduct this form of engaged communication research and teaching do something more than stand outside the stream of human activity. They immerse themselves in that stream to affect positive social change with 
and for those who are marginalized. In addition to describing and interpreting all those things I mentioned, they also are building and constructing. And I don't mean just building theory. They are rebuilding and reconstructing. They are improving, protecting, repairing, mobilizing, organizing, inspiring, motivating, facilitating, helping, aiding, and acting, using their symbolic resources to try and make substantive material differences in the world. There is, after all, a tremendous difference between, for instance, interpreting and improving, and between explaining and rebuilding. Many rhetoricians have reminded us, Michael, Moore, Michael McGee pointing out, that speech will not fell a tree, and one cannot write a house to dwell in. To Phil Wander explaining that cries of help call for much more than appreciation. The point was captured humorously by Tony Palmieri, who responded to Stanley Fish's now famous op-ed essay in the New York Times that encouraged professors to stay in the ivory tower and avoid immersing themselves in the political struggles of our day by saying, quote, I think if I was an artist, I would draw a cartoon featuring Rome burning while Stanley Fish lectures Seneca not to douse the flames. Your job, Seneca, is to interpret the flames, not to put them out, would be the caption. Fortunately, there are communication scholars who are putting out the flames or building levees and homes or they're fanning those flames when needed. These scholars seek to make a difference through their research rather than hoping that someone else at some point in time will make a difference from that research. As Ted Koopman, then a, a University of Washington graduate student and now at San Jose State University, wrote to me in an email, these scholars are not just, quote, talking about thinking, about theorizing, about doing something, but actually practicing what we're preaching. Conquer Good admonished us a while ago that as communication scholars who traffic in symbols, images, representation, rhetorical strategy, signifying practices, the media, and the social work of talk, we should understand better than anyone else that our disciplinary practices are in the world. As engaged intellectuals, we understand that we are entangled within world systems of oppression and exploitation. Our choice is to stand alongside or against domination, but not outside, not above or beyond it. Engage communication activism scholarship that intervenes into discourse, to, stands against structural domination, transforms researchers into citizen scholars connected with their communities and the significant social justice issues that confront them, working with another rather than studying another. But that type of research and teaching represents just a trickle in the grand gulf of communication scholarship. We need far more of it, and we need to conduct it with a sense of joyful commitment to social justice that Stephen Hartnett urges. We continually talk about how communication scholarship empowers and gives voice to others. A misnomer, if ever there was one, as no one empowers or gives voice to others, as everyone has a voice, and we just need to listen for it. But what we really need to do is to empower ourselves by adding our voices and the positive material changes that can result from our symbolic actions to those of Jim, Andrew, and the many others who work so hard on the ground and here in New Orleans in the blood-soaked waters of Katrina to create, sustain, and when needed, to rebuild communities and more just communities in New Orleans and around the globe. Thank you. My deep appreciation, my deep thanks, and from my heart, my openness for your willingness, the three of you, to share your life experiences, your values, and most importantly, your thoughts regarding what I think is what should be a theme that we carry with us every day of our lives. 
I think if there's two words I learned and I kind of thought about as I would listen to these presentations, one was hope and the other was engagement. And if I may add another one, that would be the word fun, and that's what we're going to do now. I would encourage all of you to go down to the reception now, which is a welcome reception sponsored by Emerson College, which is located at 120 Boylston Street in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, we will have a, it's located on third floor Napoleon Ballroom. Please go enjoy yourself, and um, thank you all for being part of this today.